Now, a common misconception is that no real scientist believes the Bible and is a creationist. A huge number of creation scientists today, from Newton to Sarfati on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today on, on the program we're going to talk about uh, creation scientists, Bible-believing scientists. There's a widespread belief uh, that's incorrect that real scientists don't believe the Bible. Right. They believe evolution in millions of years. So it's interesting to learn that many of the, the founding fathers that's of right. major branches, branches of science were Bible-believing Christians. Uh, and, and many lesser-known scientists as well. Many scientists in general. Uh, today we're going to talk about the life and work of some of these great Bible-believing Christians. That's right. Now, either of, uh, each of these scientists either publicly acknowledged the Creator, the God of the Bible, uh, or opposed evolutionary thinking, or in many cases uh, they did or actually do today both yes, <laughs> of those right. things. And uh, these scientists found faith in God's Word um, to be perfectly compatible with their, their scientific investigations, their understanding of the world. Uh, and in some cases their faith actually sustained them through... Uh, Physical hardships, uh, the emotional hardships, just some, some really tough times. We'll talk about some of those. Yeah, for, for, for example, uh, Samuel Morse, you know, Morse, Morse Code, uh, the American who invented the telegraph, uh, the Morse Code, um, he endured a lot of frustrating years. He was penniless, uh, would, would go hungry, you know, he wasn't at the, the peak of his, uh, his career, so to speak, but, but he, he never stopped trusting God. You read about him and uh, he just believed that God was, was guiding him through uh, all the way. Right, yeah. In other cases, the influence of uh, their faith on the development of science was more direct, providing a framework for thinking properly right. about God's creation, and that led them to, uh, to make discoveries. For example, astronomers had charted the paths of planets across the sky, and they couldn't make sense of the complicated paths they saw. Yep. And many scientists gave up searching for a complicated path. They thought, well, it's just going to be chaos after all because the universe emerged from just chaos. It just evolved from random particles bumping into each other. Right. Now, in contrast to that, German astronomer Johann Kepler, famous name, reasoned that since the universe was, was not the result of chaos, it was designed by an intelligent designer, it should function according to some logical pattern. And that led him to discover the planetary laws of motion. That's right. And it was the Bible. Yeah. Yep. Now, some would say that, you know, okay, but since Darwin, you know, he made evolutionary thinking popular that, well, scientists today have given up on belief in God because now, right. you know, Darwin changed everything. Since Darwin, yeah. Yeah. But, but there are many scientists who, who, who have remained faithful to the Bible, have continued to find the Bible uh, and, and scientific investigation completely compatible. Um, now, while the contradiction between evolutionary thinking and the Bible uh, certainly provides a theological grounds for rejecting evolution. And of course, that's one of the things we do all the time on CMI. Yes. Look, look how yes. this doesn't make sense with our theology. Right. But many of these famous scientists just argued against evolution because it just didn't make sense on scientific <laughs> grounds. Uh, you know, and these include uh, brilliant French chemist uh, Louis Pasteur. We're going to talk a little bit more about him later, uh, for example. Right? Yeah, that's right. Spontaneous generation. Uh, the idea <laughs> that... Um, that li a living organism can arise spontaneously yep. uh, without previous life is, is an essential part of evolutionary theory. Right. That life came from lifelessness. At one point, uh, yeah. It has different names today, not spontaneous generation anymore, but it's basically the same thing. Despite all efforts of evolutionary scientists, not one example of this has ever been seen, ever. That's right. uh, Pasteur's scientific finding, findings clearly demonstrate that, uh, that life coming from non-life doesn't work. Uh, the spontaneous genera generation just doesn't work. Exactly. And uh, consequently, Pasteur strongly opposed uh, Darwin's theory That's right. as a result of that. Now, although these men we're going to look at here today are brilliant scientists and, and uh, devout Christians, of course, if you look uh, and you do some detailed historical analysis, you're going to find that they've, they had flaws in their characters just like every other person on the planet. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, for example, <laughs> Sir Isaac Newton, Newton uh, because of his confidence in his own finding, he, he was, um, and his eagerness to continue, uh, you know, onto his new discoveries, um, he, he was pretty impatient with a lot of people that, you know, couldn't really 
keep up to speed with them, of course. Mm. Who, who, who <laughs> could? <laughs> um, and, and he also tended to view other people that were working in the same field as competitors uh, in a way. So everyone uh, has flaws, and, and you can see that in these great men as well. Yeah, now, these shortcomings just serve to emphasize the, the, that uh, they need God as much as we need God today, that we, we struggle with pride, and, and so did they, and, and many other things. We need God's help, and they did as well. That's right. Now, because of a limited amount of time here, of course, uh, these scientists are going to discuss, they're merely a handful of, of the amount right. we could. Yeah. But to, to get a complete list, uh, you can actually visit creation.com uh, slash bios, or you can just watch the bottom of the screen, and you're going to see name after name. And just keep in mind, these are all Bible-believing Christians and great scientists. And we'll be back. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking this week about famous creation scientists from, uh, well, all throughout history, actually. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's kick this off with Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, Bacon, Lord Chancellor of England, uh, he's usually considered to be the man primarily responsible for the formulation and establishment of the so-called scientific method. Right. Right? And uh, he stressed experimentation and induction from data rather than um, philosophical deduction in, in the tradition of Aristotle. And Bacon's writings are, are also credited with leading uh, to the founding of the Royal Society of London. Okay. Yeah. So Sir Francis was a, a devout believer in the Bible. He, he actually wrote, there are two books laid before us to study to prevent our falling into error. First, the volume of the scriptures, which reveal the will of God, then the volume of the creatures, which express his power. And he also wrote, to conclude, therefore, let no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works, divinity or philosophy, but rather let men endeavor an endless progress or proficiency in both. Right. Now, Bacon had some philosophical differences that right. we wouldn't believe today, we wouldn't accept today. If you want some more information on that, go to creation.com slash Bacon. Now, he was a Bible believer, yep. but he was a scientist as well. That's right. Uh, next up, arguably the greatest scientist of all time, Sir Isaac Newton. Yeah. Uh, to try and list his credentials and, and his scientific achievements would be pretty well impossible. You could take days. Uh, of course, libraries of books have been written about this, this man and, uh, and his achievements, his discoveries, etc. Um, and Newton's contributions uh, to science were, were many and varied. Uh, they covered revolutionary ideas um, and some really practical inventions, right? Um, right. His, his work in physics, mathematics, astronomy, uh, so of course, they're all of importance to work today. All scientists have kind of built off of what he, he discovered. And um, actually, his contributions to any one of these fields of science would have made him a great famous scientist. Of course, you put them yeah. all together and, yeah. and stuff. But what is uh, interesting is what he believed about God and, and, and the mm -hmm. Bible. Right? Yeah, well, let's start with, uh, with a quote. Uh, as some skeptics have tried to say that Newton just paid lip service right. to, uh, to the Bible. He's he, a he man of his time, it says. Yeah. I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God, written by men who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. He also said this, This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of His dominion, He is wont to be called Lord God, or universal ruler, the supreme being the Supreme God is a being eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect. <laughs> now those strong are words. Straight from his yeah. mouth. And yep. you've got, uh, what's interesting is, of course, you've got atheists and, and skeptics often criticizing creationists as being unscientific. Yes, yes. And, and yet here's yep. the greatest scientist of, of all time. <laughs> this is what he said about atheists in opposition to God's word. He said, opposition to godliness is atheism in uh, profession and idolatry in practice. Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. I love that quote. Yeah. Just, uh, a lot of fun. But uh, so, so obviously belief in Genesis does not detract from doing science. In fact, in a lot of cases, it enhanced it. Right. Uh, Newton reasoned that since the same God created the heavens and the earth, that the same laws should apply throughout. 
and uh, that's what operational science is based on. Exactly. Now, Newton, of course, uh, he, he wasn't immune to struggle and, and hardship. You read about him. He yep. had uh, health challenges when he was younger. He had financial challenges when he was trying to get educated. Um, he had political uh, you know, stress challenges later on in life as he was teaching and so on. But, uh, but he, had a, he had a pretty fascinating life. But again, his, his times of hardship didn't produce bitterness. You know, it, he it, went it, to scripture. He went to scripture. Solution. His yeah. own words show what he did when, uh, when these things were happening. He said, trials are medicines which our gracious and wise physician gives because we need them, and the proportions, the frequency, and the weight of them to what the case requires. Let us trust his skill and thank him for the prescription. Yeah, pretty amazing. Fantastic. Greatest scientist who ever lived, Isaac Newton, and a strong Bible believing scientist and a young earth creationist. We'll be back. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong, while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate, particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. On this week's uh, episode, we're talking about famous creation scientists. We are, yeah. yes. Um, each time we go to the fridge and take out a bottle of milk <laughs> or something like that, it should make us think of one particular scientist, French scientist, Louis Pasteur. Yes. Uh, Pasteur discovered that milk turned sour because of the action of tiny organisms too small to see with the naked eye. He developed a process of gently heating foodstuffs like milk yep. to, uh, to kill these organisms without changing the flavor or nutritional values. Brilliant. Uh, this process is named pasteurization. You may have heard of that. You see it on your milk there and so yeah. on, in honor of its developer. It's, uh, it's just one of Pasteur's great contributions to science. That's right, and he got, a, got off to a pretty young start at 15 years of age. He, he went to Paris to complete his secondary schooling. Uh, he went on to complete a Bachelor of Science degree at the Royal College in uh, Bezazon in uh, 1842. And at the age of 20, um, received a Master of Science degree. Uh, in 1845 at age 23 and then achieved a doctoral degree and eventually became professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg. Pretty yeah. accomplished gentleman. Yeah, Pasteur loved applied rather than theoretical science. Uh, Pasteur's findings in the field of fermentation helped establish a new branch of science, microbiology. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. In 1857, Pasteur returned to the Ecole Normale as the director of scientific studies where he continued his work on microbes. Mm -hmm. Now, the ancient Greeks believed that small animals such as worms, mice, maggots, and so on, sprang to life automatically from the non-living matter laying around, such as uh, rotting flour, a sweaty shirt, decaying meat, and that kind of thing. This belief in that, that living matter arose from non-living matter is called spontaneous generation. You may have heard that. Uh, Pasteur's experiments clearly showed that even for microbes, that life came only from living things. Right. Uh, he said this, microbes, uh, micro microscopic beings must come into the world from parents similar to themselves. That's right. what he said. Which mirrors what the scripture says, that things reproduce after their own kind. It does. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Now, Pastor's work, th this should have dealt a death blow, really, to the, to the idea of spontaneous Absolutely. generation. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, spontaneous generation or life coming from non-life, however you want to phrase it, because you'll hear sometimes skeptics try to skirt this right. issue. by biogenesis. Yes, and, yeah. and all that stuff. Life coming from non-life, um, that's essential to the theory of evolution yeah. and essential yeah. to atheism because you've got to explain how you got here without God so life's got to happen by part itself. Part of the process. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, despite all of the efforts of evolutionary scientists, not one observable case of spontaneous generation has ever been seen. And of course, Pasteur's findings, they, they conflicted with, with this idea. And, uh, and so he was a strong opponent of, of Darwin's theory, actually, on, on a scientific basis. So, mm -hmm. so while he was solving many practical problems like the preservation of foods and the de detection of unwanted microbes, etc., um, his mind was actually laying the foundation uh, for the next uh, great theoretical advance, and that was the, the idea that many diseases in animals and people came uh, were we, or were the result of these germs that, that entered the body and multiplied there and things like that. So he right. actually uh, yeah. uh, developed things like vaccines for rabies and, and so on. And I, I don't think people really understand how much... Uh, of, a, of a benefit, uh, you know, Pasteur's work has been to our society. Work, yeah. Yeah. While the French government honored Pasteur with its highest award, the Legion of Honor, uh, much of the medical profession still resisted his ideas. 
a uh, large part of the opposition was a reaction to pastors' own opposition to spontaneous generation and Darwinism. <laughs> That's right. So they, they didn't like him because he opposed that. Yeah. Pasteur is generally recognized today as, as having made the greatest contribution of any one man to saving human lives. That's, That's right. quite a label to have. Yeah. yeah. And again, he, he saw no conflict between science and Christianity. In fact, he believed, and he actually quote, the quote is, science brings men nearer to God, which makes sense if God created everything. Of course it does. It, of course it, it does. does. Yeah. And uh, in his work as, as a scientist, he perceived uh, evidence of wisdom and desire design, not randomness, not chaos, and he stated that the more I study nature, the more I, I stand amazed at the work of the Creator. Uh, of course, he died on September 28th of 1895 after a, a long and fruitful life, but his, his contributions to science were just truly outstanding. His Christian faith, again, sustained him through many trials. He firmly believed in creation. He strongly opposed Darwin's theory of evolution and, uh, and, and on, the, on the basis that it just didn't match what science was showing. Right, yeah. An important point to make uh, uh, involved pastors' discoveries uh, that atheistic evolutionists often criticize Christians yeah. for believing in miracles. Right. It's, good. it's kind of an interesting side note here. But enough prodding reveals that skeptics believe in miracles. They have to believe in miracles because of something that we just finished saying. That's right. Uh, pastor proved that life does not, life comes from life. Right. And yet evolution theory would say at some point, at some point, life came from lifelessness, from some chemicals. Right. And the thing is, life coming from life is a scientific law that began with Pasteur. That's right. If you break a scientific law, that you're talking about supernatural, something that's above nature, that's called a miracle. That's right. So for evolutionists, they actually have to have a miraculous event in order to kickstart evolution. They have to actually believe that in, <laughs> in things that are unscientific yes. to make their idea work. Right. We'll do The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. Welcome back. Our subject today is famous creation scientists throughout history. Uh, let's move on. George Washington Carver, famous yes. Bible-believing scientist. He was considered the world's top authority in peanuts and sweet potatoes, yep. uh, interestingly, and their products. Born a slave in the U.S., uh, he worked his way through college in the north and then returned to the south. Uh, devoting his life to improving the quality of southern farmlands and the economic prosperity of his people. He was, uh, he was black. That's right. Yeah. He, he's an amazingly fascinating and humble guy. I actually went mm. to the George Washington Carver Museum when I was in Missouri. Yeah. And, and it was really interesting, and, and I'd really encourage anybody that gets a chance, because he was just such a, such a neat guy. Um, he was a faculty member at the Tuskegee uh, Institute in Alabama. And his first laboratory was actually made from discarded items that he and his students found in the local landfill. He was, you know, he, he had chanced it to, to kind of get fame and fortune, but we, he wanted to help uh, help folks that were in the South. Right. And so he went there and they picked up old old things oh. and they put together a oh, budget lab. A, a budget <laughs> lab is right. And uh, basically the soil in the surrounding areas uh, had been devastated by, by years of cotton farming. Hmm. You know, they, they hadn't let the, the ground fallow or anything like that. And so it depleted the soil of all its nutrients. And so he discovered, of course, that rotating crops, and particularly with peanuts and sweet potatoes, it helped revitalize the soil. And then, of course, he had to figure out what to do with all these peanuts he had. And people started complaining, you know. And so, peanuts. yep, he, he actually came up with 300 uses for, for the common peanut, uh, household things that we use today that we don't even realize when you, you look through the list. But uh, he, he revolutionized the southern farms and the economy, of course, uh, of, uh, yeah, of the south. Yeah, you can think of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you'd have to look at the list. It's, it's, yeah, it's actually yeah, more than you think is things. peanut oil. Now, and he was always very quick to point out that uh, where his inspiration came from. Yep. He's, he said this, I indulge in very little lip service, but ask the great creator silently, daily, and often many times a day to permit me to speak to him through the three great kingdoms of the world in which he created the animal, mineral, and vegetable kingdoms to understand their relations to each other and our relations to them and to the great God who made all of us. Right. 
Uh, incredible. He, he was a very, very humble man. The quotes that are around the museum reveal, you know, uh, his humbleness and, and it's just his, his adoration for God. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, he'd wake up every morning, he'd go for a walk and he'd pray and he'd ask, ask God to help him. And uh, of course, all over the museum, you see these quotes. Yeah, and, he, and he was invited by Thomas Edison to come join his team exactly. and, he, and he turned it down. He, he did because Edison, of course, was going to take his, his discoveries and patent them and make money off them. Right. And Carver actually said, look, God gave me this information. And he, it, actually there's a quote at the museum that says that he said, look, if I have information that you want, for the price of a postage stamp, you can have it. Because mm. God gave me this stuff. It's not mine. He just revealed it to me. So I'll, I'll write it down and I'll, I'll send it to you and you can yeah. have anything that's in my wow. noggin. So he actually said, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. And reading about nature is fine, but if a person walks in the woods and listens carefully, he can learn more than what is in books for they speak with the voice of God. He was actually uh, came before a group of senators uh, and and uh, he was arguing for a, a certain, um, well, I won't get into it because it'll take, take too long. But anyway, he, he came before these senators and he started speaking. They gave him 10 minutes and then they gave him an extra half an hour. And then by the time I think he was done oh speaking, my. it was like two hours. And at the end, they, they said, well, where did you come up with the, all these ideas for your, for your crops and stuff like that? And he said, well, I found it in a book, the Bible. Hmm. And uh, this, this surprised many people. And he quoted Genesis as his inspiration. He said, the secret of my success, it's simple. It's found in the Bible. And he talked about how, how Genesis talked about, uh, you know, everything being given for food. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, he was just a really yeah, incredible. Yeah. In 1939, he was awarded the Roosevelt Medal uh, with the following citation. This is what it said. To a scientist humbly seeking the guidance of God and a liberator to men of the white race as well as the black. Yeah. He was black. Interesting how they and at that time that yeah. out. Yeah. 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 So Carver died in uh, 1943. And um, he was just an amazing scientist. But let, let's move forward to present day. I mean, okay. we've kind of been going through history, showing some, some different scientists and so on. But uh, let's, let's explore a modern creation scientist, and that'd be uh, Dr. Raymond Damadian. Yes. And uh, Damadian, he's probably a little too humble to, to you know, accept the title super scientist, but he, he actually is a super scientist. Um, and and there are many people who have uh, been saved by the uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging scanning technology, would, uh, would probably really appreciate uh, that title for him because so many people have been helped. Yeah. So uh, yeah. when we get back, we'll, we'll get into, into Demadian's uh, discoveries and uh, talk a little further. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at Creation.com. All right, today we're talking about famous creation scientists. Right. We've talked about some that lived a uh, um, long time ago. Uh, we're talking about Dr. Raymond De Demadian, mm -hmm. and he was the inventor of the MRI. Uh, this is hailed as one of the greatest diagnostic breakthroughs ever. Right. Uh, this technique using advanced uh, physics, uh, advanced principles in physics and computing lets doctors visualize many organs and their uh, diseased parts without the risks of exploratory surgery and other techniques right. that... Uh, uh, other other scanning methods and so on. It's just just incredible. Uh, his invention earned him several top awards, including the United States National Medal of, Medal, Medal of Technology, the Lincoln Edison Medal, and induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, alongside names like Thomas Edison, right. Alexander Graham Bell, and the Wright brothers, and so on. He's a Bible-believing Christian. Yeah. Um, he's uh, he's convinced of the truth of Genesis. Uh, I've, I've met him on several several occasions at some of our larger creation conferences. Right. He says emphatically that his greatest scientific discovery was to find that, quote, the highest purpose of a man can find for his life is to serve the will of God. That's it's right. Amazing. And he's not afraid to put his faith on the line. You know, a, a lot of creationist uh, scientists, that, that can be detrimental to your career because there's an yes. incredible bias about uh, any scientist out there that believes in the Bible and things like that. And he, he, he knows this full well. We don't have time to delve into that. But if you actually go to um, uh, the link at the bottom of the page here, you'll see 
how uh, Dr. Damadian was persecuted for his faith. And actually, many cre uh, creation scientists have been. And there's actually a book right. uh, yeah. that's been written about it. It's called Slaughter of the Dissonance. And uh, if you'd like to receive this book and look into that further, you can actually go to our website, punch in the code CMLSOTD, uh, and you get 30% off this book. Slaughter of the Dissonance. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yep. really um, it's intriguing and disturbing to see what's happened to some people because of their faith in, in God and His Word. Yes, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's move forward again. We'll talk about one of our staff scientists, yeah. Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Um, amazing scientist. Uh, he obtained his um, Bachelor of Science uh, honors in chemistry with uh, two physics papers submitted, uh, or, or two, two papers talked about nuclear and condensed matter physics. His yep. PhD in chemistry was awarded for a thesis entitled The Spectroscopic Study of Calcogen. Calgen Cal calcogenide, calcogenide <laughs> ring and cage molecules. Now, if yeah. you know what that means, then <laughs> awesome, more power to you. He, he has co-authored papers in mainstream scientific journals on high-temperature superconductors and selenium-containing ring and cage-shaped molecules. Many skeptics say, again, no real scientist believes in creation, uh, but uh, Jonathan definitely fits the, the description of a real scientist. Yeah. And a, and a brilliant one at that. He's published uh, in a number of secular journals, including co-authoring a paper in the probably the premier, the world's premier journal, Nature, right. uh, when he was only 22. Yeah. Now, uh, very few people that are interested in creation evolution would not have heard of Jonathan. Right. Right. Yes. He's, a, of his he's books. He's yeah. very famous. Books. Yeah. He's a best-selling author. Um, they're they're kind of like standards for the creation evolution debate for Christians uh, looking to engage. Um, you know, with people that hold to evolutionary and long age views and things like that. And one of the reasons they've become so popular is just because of his clear writing style. You know, yes. when you read Jonathan's, yep. it, it's not that he's, you know, he, he, can, he can bring it to this level, but he can also bring it to a level where the average yeah. person can just really understand. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting because if you, if you look at Jonathan's uh, testimony, um, it wasn't an emotional need. It wasn't any time of crisis or anything like that. Right. He actually says that it was purely a logical decision to, that, that he became a Christian. He, he was uh, studying at Victoria University in New Zealand, and some Christians befriended him. And he said, okay, I'm going to investigate Christianity. And uh, he found it was entirely logical, entirely defensible. And this led to his conversion when he was 20. And uh, he hasn't looked back. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Yeah. His first book for CMI, Refuting Evolution, that's probably the... Uh, 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 the, the best-selling creationist book ever, yep. uh, and, and still today. One of his passions is chess, and a former New Zealand chess champion. Yep. Uh, he often plays chess at some of our larger conferences, and he plays blindfolded. So he's blindfolded against sighted players, other players that don't have blindfolds yep. on. They just call out the... the, the they they the, call out the move. I don't play chess. I don't know how it works. And yep. he just he beats them all. He's blindfolded. They're not. How do you... Amazing, amazing yeah. mind. But um, a lot of Jonathan's resources on our website. You can go to creation.com. You can see many articles, many books, etc. Yeah. And he's also a contributor to Creation Magazine. Creation Magazine. Yeah. Yep. You can get a free copy. Get a free sample copy, digital copy online. Go to creation.com/freemag and have a look at Creation Magazine. The information there is a lot like the information that we present on the show. We'll see you next week, and uh, get Creation Magazine. <laughs> see you next week. <laughs>